In Life is Beautiful, Roberto Benigni finds love, comedy, and beauty where you would least expect it. One of the most basic screenwriting rules is that over the course of a film, a character should change as they learn that what they want is not what they need. But what if we create a character whose want is the same as his need, a wise character who completely understands himself and his world? Enter Guido Orefice, a man defined by his resilience. Guido refuses to let the changing situation change him, and as a result, he becomes one of the most compelling characters in cinema. The film is split into two acts, separated by location, Act 1 in Arezzo and Act 2 in the concentration camp, but in both, Guido's want remains the same. Guido wants to love. I want to make love with her, but not one time, but many times. But she won't tell me never. Prima si mangia, e poi io ci fa l'amore due o tre volte, se ce la fa. But what defines Guido more than just the love he wants or believes in are the tactics he uses to overcome his obstacles. Rather than kind of tell the audience uh, uh, who a character is, I like to show the audience what a character wants. It, it, it all boils down to intention and obstacles. Somebody wants something, something standing in their way of getting it. And the tactics that that character uses uh, to overcome the obstacle is going to define uh, uh, who, who the character is. One important aspect of Guido's character is his bravery and his confidence. After learning that a minister from Rome is visiting the school where the woman he likes, Dora, works as a teacher, Guido decides to impersonate the minister, and his character trait of confidence is shown as an endearing tactic that he uses to get the love that he wants. In Arezzo, the obstacle to Guido's love is the town official to whom Dora is engaged. In the concentration camp, the obstacle to his love is the Nazis. But remember, Guido is one of those characters who doesn't change. Nothing will break him. So in both situations, Guido's tactics of confidence and bravery are the same. Buongiorno, principessa! Stanotte! This movie is a masterclass in setup and payoff. In the first act, the phrase Buongiorno Principessa is used seven times, beginning as a witty spontaneous greeting Buongiorno Principessa and returning every time as a symbol of Guido's love for Dora. Buongiorno Principessa. Buongiorno principessa. Oddio. Buongiorno principessa. Buongiorno principessa. <laughs> Come hai detto? Eh, buongiorno principessa, la vedi qui sulla torta? The seventh time the phrase is heard, it is actually spoken by the couple's son, Giosuè. Guido is so charismatic that he has rubbed off onto his son, and now the phrase transforms from a symbol of Guido's love for Dora to a symbol for the love of the family as a whole. This is an important setup because a few scenes before Dora hears the loudspeaker, she is told that all the children in the camp will be exterminated in a gas chamber under the guise of taking a shower. So Dora becomes deathly worried for the life of her son. And so when Guido says buongiorno principessa on the loudspeaker, it is an affirmation that they are both alive, that they both love her. In fact, this scene sets up many story elements. Josue protests against cleaning himself in the shower. This defines a tactic received from his father becomes what Josue needs in the concentration camp. And this scene also sets up a prop you can hide in, the nightstand, which is later paid off as the metal cabinet. But perhaps my favourite setup and payoff in this scene 
and the whole film is that of Schopenhauer. Fiori, venite, comodino, vieni, vieni, comodino! Schopenhauer, la volontà, voglio che comodino venga, vieni, comodino! Svegliati, svegliati, svegliati! Che c'è? Ma che fai? Oh, funziona in pieno! Funziona che? Schopenhauer! Ma lo sai che ho detto in questo momento, prima di svegliarsi, svegliati, ta! Ti sei svegliato il colpo! 19th century German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer saw that the world was full of sickness, old age, pain and death, and thought that this world must be the work of a devil who delights in our sufferings. He saw human suffering as the result of our instinctual desires. He defined that the Wille zum Leben, the will to life, is a blind, dumb, insistent force, a Freudian libido that throws us directly into the boil of that which will consume us. Inspired by Buddhism, Schopenhauer's ideal solution to the suffering of the world was for us to become monk-like figures who are able to overcome our instinctual desires and thus live free of suffering through a kind of intellectual enlightenment that I like to equate to apathy. So yes, I couldn't disagree with Schopenhauer more. For me, the will to life, the natural instinct to love, seek pleasure and defy that evil creator is a thing of beauty. And there's nobody who would agree with me more than Roberto Bernini. In this scene, Schopenhauer's philosophy is set up through this idea of the will to life. But the film actually distorts the original pessimism of Schopenhauer's will and colonizes it in a very cheeky and postmodern way. Viewed through a narratological perspective, Schopenhauer's philosophy describes that all humans want instinctual things like sex and children, but need to abstain from these desires and choose intellectual enlightenment. But remember, Guido is a character who is confident and sure of himself. What Guido wants is also what he needs, and so his will to life is his intellectual enlightenment. For Guido, want is need, and instinct is intellect. Guido is a clown, but he has this internal wisdom. He knows that if he wants something, it's in his best interest to get it. So the film transforms Schopenhauer's original pessimism of the will to life and converts it into this metaphorical technique that Guido uses to get what he wants, showing that the smartest thing you can do is to believe in your instincts. So the Schopenhauer technique is set up and then paid off. Set up again, and paid off one final time. In real life, there's no way this would work, but this is fiction. Remember, Guido is such a compelling character because he is so confident in himself. He doesn't need to listen to the guards, the racist Italian scientists, or even Schopenhauer. He needs only to listen to himself. And with a little imagination, that self-confidence and that bravery, well, it pays off. To quote Matthias Hosel, Guido is compelling because his qualities are unbreakable. He is a man that smiles on his way to death. He fights his setting by refusing to change. And when he dies, we know he won, because he did everything he could to give in to the will to life, and he loved with all his heart. The tragedy of the Holocaust is not something to laugh at, but it's definitely something you can laugh against. In Life is Beautiful, Benini shows us that the most beautiful thing about life is you. So stay true to yourself. And if you can learn to love others with the same confidence with which you love yourself, then you can find the beauty in just about anything. Prego, principessa. Dove siamo finiti? Ma ci siamo già stati insieme in questo posto. Io e lei? 
Hey everyone, my channel is full of videos just like this one, and films and shows that I'm really passionate about. So if you like this video, be sure to check out my channel. I really wanted to make an in-depth comparison between Benini and Chaplin, and look at the political representation in modern times and Life is Beautiful, and I also really wanted to go way further into setups and payoffs in this film, but unfortunately, I just don't have the views or the subscribers to really back that kind of effort up right now. Today I really want to give a shout out and a big thank you to Pietro Schito and Matthias Hosel, who both made Life is Beautiful videos on YouTube and they were very influential in terms of creating this video today. In particular, Pietro's video goes way more in depth into the setups and payoffs in this film, so if you want to see all of those, then make sure you check out his video. The fact that even his 20 minute video doesn't go into all the setups and payoffs in the movie though, really goes to show just how concise and tightly written this screenplay is. I love making highly edited videos like this, but in the future I may want to expand my channel into more casual content as well as these standard video essays, so if you have recommendations on other films I should do video essays like this on, or also new or upcoming films and shows that I can review more casually, then let me know in the comment section. With all of that being said, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time on Shiny Reviews.